Good morning, Daybreak. Hi. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Hi, everyone. Hello, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. Good morning, Daybreak. I hope you are doing fine. A few weeks before the COVID plague descended on us, I had a very pleasant visit in my office with a couple of gentlemen from the local Muslim mosque. I had invited them over because I wanted to meet them. I wanted to learn a little bit about them as individuals and also about the Muslim community in Airdrie. I wanted to find out which branch of Islam they represented and so forth. It just so happened that the next day I attended a pastor's meeting in Calgary where one of the speakers shared his conviction that essentially every Muslim is an aspiring terrorist. I remember thinking as I drove away from that meeting that the speaker that day probably wouldn't have been too pleased to learn what I had done the day before. The reason I mention that is because we need to be careful about stereotyping people. Stereotyping people simply because of a certain ethnicity, or in this case, a certain religious orientation. And perhaps to bring that point home, let me ask you, How would you feel as a Christian to be told that the insurrectionists who attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th just passed were all Christians and they represent Christianity? Hey, some of them were carrying a big wooden cross. Some of them were carrying signs such as, Jesus saves. Others of them had symbols and emblems representing their Christian faith. But I'm sure that some of us would not want to be linked with that group at all. This morning, as we continue in our series that I have called, If God Uses Nobodies, Why Does Everybody Want to Be a Somebody? We're focusing on the Old Testament character Ishmael. His story is found in Genesis 16 and 21. I referred to it in part a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about his mother, Hagar. This morning I invite you to think with me about a very curious story, another very curious story that we find in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. This ancient story about Hagar and Ishmael has contributed to significant controversy and confusion that continues right up until the present day. So, I say to you this morning, tongue-in-cheek, hey, let's resolve it today once and for all. As we consider the story of Ishmael this morning, I invite you to consider both an observation and a directive based on this monumental story of a nobody who became a somebody and why. 
Now, before I take the time to read to you from Genesis 16 and Genesis 21, the essence of the story of Ishmael, I want to remind you of the background leading up to the events that I am about to read. Remember that God's promise had been made to Abraham and Sarah that God would make of them a great nation. The only problem was, as the months and years went by, no children were born to Abraham and Sarah. You can imagine the consternation and the frustration that they must have felt as they tried to reconcile God's promise on the one hand and the fact that they had no children on the other hand. And so finally, and you know the story well, we're told that Sarah said to Abraham, Abraham, look it, this has gone on long enough. I want you to take my maidservant, Hagar, sleep with her, and perhaps she can conceive a child for us. We need to help God out, obviously. And so, Abraham did what his wife directed. He slept with Hagar, the maidservant, and from that union was born Ishmael. I want to read to you, first of all, from Genesis chapter 16, beginning at that point in this story. The angel also said to Hagar, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael which means God listens, God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Now I pause just a moment to let those words sink in. Hagar is directed to name her male child Ishmael, meaning God listens. God hears. That's a wonderful sentiment. Perhaps some of you today need to be reminded that God listens. God hears. God Ishmaels. The Lord, the angel said, has heard your cry of distress. The Lord has heard. That's the meaning of the name Ishmael. I want to underline that because, as you will see, for many, many people, especially Christians, Jews, and Arabs today, when they hear the name Ishmael, the first thought that comes to their minds is not that God listens or that God hears. And so I want to highlight the meaning of the name Ishmael for you in light of some of the things that I'm going to mention later on this morning. The angel of the Lord then went on and said to Hagar, Genesis 16, verse 12, this son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Ooh. That's quite a message for a new mom to absorb. This child, Ishmael, God listens, God hears, is going to be a troublemaker. He's going to be against everyone, and everyone is going to be against him. The Scripture tells us that thereafter, Genesis 16, 13, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. 
she said, not only are you the one who hears, but you are the God who sees me. She also said, I truly have seen the one who sees me. And we talked about that dimension of the Hagar story a couple of weeks ago. Those words of Hagar, which are so rich in meaning. And so we see that Elohim, El, short, Ishmael, El is the short term for God, is very present in the story of the birth of Ishmael to Hagar. I want to go now to Genesis chapter 21 and read a lengthy passion or or portion about the story of the birth of Ishmael, beginning at verse 8 of Genesis 21. In between Genesis 16 and 21, Isaac has been born now to Abraham and Sarah. God has come through for them. God has given them the son that he had promised them he would give. And so we read Genesis 21, verse 8. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. And in the Hebrew, there's a bit of a play on words there. The Hebrew word Ishak, Isaac, which means laughter. In the Hebrew, it says, Sarah observed Isaac, laughter, laughing at her or sorry, Ishmael laughing at her son Isaac, or laughter. And so there's a bit of a play of words that is going on in this passage. So Sarah turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son. I won't have it. Sarah, interesting lady comes across as a pretty strong personality in the book of Genesis. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you. For Isaac is the son of through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. Make note of that verse. It's very important. I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son Ishmael, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. A number of very interesting and perplexing dynamics going on in that story. What is godly What is friendly about sending a mother and her son off to wander aimlessly in the desert? When the water was gone, Hagar put the boy in the shade of a bush, then went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die she said as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. Remember? Ishmael. God has heard. God listens. 
God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying. I want you to understand how in the author's mind that concept of God hearing is repeated over and over again in this text. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Now, at this point, I want to offer you simply an observation and I'm sorry I screwed you guys up. I went ahead and didn't mention this before. But the observation about this passage that I just read to you, this lengthy passion, is simply this. For better or worse, most of us are conversant with how Christian tradition has treated the Ishmael story. All right, hear that again. This is simply an observation that I want to make regarding the story that I just read to you. For better or worse, most of us are conversant with how Christian tradition has treated the Ishmael story. Let me summarize for you a very popular interpretation of the Hagar and Ishmael story, one that probably many of us have heard for a good portion of our life. For centuries, many Christians, Jews, and Muslims, all of whom, remember, consider Abraham to be a key figure in their faiths, Christians, Jews, and Muslims have taken it for granted that the Arab people have descended through Abraham and Ishmael. One writer says this, the idea that the Arabs are the physical descendants of Abraham through Ishmael is indeed taken by many non-Muslims as well as Muslims as a genealogical and historical fact. And as I've suggested, many of us are conversant with that. We've heard that most of our lives, and we've probably heard it in the context of this is what the Bible teaches. Many authors, many teachers often treat the name Ishmael as a kind of code word for Islam or for Muslims. Many teachers, many pastors look to Genesis for prophetic anticipations of the trajectory of the Arabs and of Islam. And many of us have heard over the years those who trace the spiritual roots of the historical conflict between Arabs and Jews back to the rejection of Hagar and Ishmael. In fact, you don't have to look far today to hear authorities who would tell us that the modern Israeli-Palestinian conflict 
presently at play in the Middle East is a direct occurrence of the rivalry between Isaac and Ishmael and their competing blessings. This line of thinking, this line of reasoning is very common, very popular in North American evangelical circles to the point where many are convinced it is what the Bible teaches. Well, let me bring just a little bit of truth or reality into the picture. By referring to a name that will interest you, the name is Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus. Who's that? Flavius Josephus was a Jewish historian who lived, who lived in the latter part of the first century after Christ essentially a contemporary of the Apostle Paul. He was a historian who popularized the notion that I have just referred to. He popularized the notion that Ishmael is the father of the modern-day Arabic people and, by extension, of modern-day Islam. It is from Josephus that this notion that I've been referring to, a notion that many of us not only are familiar with, but actually believe to be historical fact, came from. There's only one problem, and that is that there's at least 2,000 years between the birth of Ishmael and Isaac and when Flavius Josephus came on the scene. The point is this, the dysfunctional travails of Abraham's family are not the place to seek out the spiritual roots of the modern day Middle East conflict. Now obviously this is not the place to go into all of the different points in this ongoing debate about where do the Arabic people come from? Where do the modern day Muslims come from? All I want to register with you this morning is to be careful before you believe that every popular notion that is expounded, even in evangelical circles, is what the Bible actually teaches because there are many evangelical scholars who would raise a strong disagreement on that point. It is from Josephus that we get this popular assumption, this popular connection between Arabs and Abraham that has been passed into the consciousness of modern Christians so that we believe that there's no two ways about it. The Arabs and Islam come directly from the seed of Ishmael. And so I make simply the observation to you that for better or worse, most of us are conversant with how the Christian tradition has treated the Ishmael story. Which leads me to make a directive this morning. And the directive is this. Given what I have said so far, I suggest to you that it would be better to allow the Bible itself to interpret the Ishmael story for us. History, traditions, Popular notions, they all exist, and they can teach us 
much. But never lose sight of the fact that traditions, accepted wisdom, popular wisdom as it's sometimes called, is not always accurate or even biblical. And that's why I make this directive to you that it would be better for us to allow the Bible to interpret the Ishmael story for us than to allow Flavius Josephus or any of his many modern-day followers interpret the story of Ishmael for us. I want to take you to the New Testament, to Galatians chapter 4, Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. Let's see how Paul treats the story of Ishmael and Hagar in Galatians chapter 4. I'm picking up at verse 21. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife, Hagar, was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia, where she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been born, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes, are children of the promise just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what did the Scripture say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. What on earth is the Apostle Paul telling us? St. Paul is using the Ishmael Hagar story not to identify a physical ethnicity or a competing religion, but as representative of those living in spiritual bondage to the law, and as such, are still trying to find their own way through human effort to be accepted by God. In other words, what St. Paul is driving at, at approximately the same time that Josephus was giving his theory on how to spin the story of Ishmael and Hagar, Paul gives no awareness at all regarding anything to do with Arabs or with Islam as it relates to the Hagar and Ishmael story. 
The point simply being, before you become too planted in cement over how to interpret the Hagar Ishmael story based on tradition or how it has been spun to you over the years that you have lived, recognize the significant difference that exists in Scripture between how St. Paul treats the story and the significance of the story for Paul and how a Jewish historian named Josephus interpreted the story. It's simply a cause for pause. Paul uses Isaac and Sarah as representative of those living in obedience to the promise of grace. Ridiculous as that may seem to some. And as such, they have accepted God's way of making us children of promise, children of the Spirit. The point of the Ishmael Hagar story that St. Paul writes about has nothing to do with Arabs or Muslims. It has everything to do with the basis on which we are accepted by God. Therefore, my friends, I want to offer a couple of practical directives to you as I conclude this morning. Firstly, I encourage you to develop a healthy skepticism for neatly packaged ideas or systems of religious thought which try to explain the modern conflict between the Jews and Palestinians in modern Israel. Just be careful about some of what you hear in that regard from reputable authorities in Christendom. More often than not, it involves a lot of speculation. Or to put it another way, more often than not, it involves a lot more of Josephus than of St. Paul. So be careful about that. Secondly, and I think perhaps most importantly, next time you hear the name Ishmael, which means what? The Lord listens. The Lord hears. The next time you hear the name Ishmael, don't think of Arabs, Muslims, or terrorists. Think of the choice we all have. Every time we face an obstacle or some kind of decision in life, where we have a choice whether we take matters into our own hands, as Abraham and Sarah did, leading to the birth of Ishmael, or we wait for God to work out his plan as he eventually did in giving Abraham and Sarah Isaac. The story of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac is a great reminder to us that sometimes it is difficult to wait for God to come through. It is difficult for us to wait for God to come through on his promises to us. So let's help God out. Let's take matters into our own hands. The story of Ishmael and Hagar suggests that that can lead to complications. As I look at this complicated, and some would even say convoluted story of Ishmael and Hagar. 
and ask myself, what are we supposed to learn from this complexity? One of the lessons that I derive is simply this, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Some of us need to hear that today. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Given the kind of world in which we live, we get all kinds of encouragement every day, explicit and implicit, to figure things out for yourself. Make your own decision already. We don't get a lot of encouragement to live by faith. The older I get, with each passing day, week, month, year, one of my prayers to God is that he will give me a faith that is sharp, that is informed, that is good at critical thinking, that isn't gullible no matter how popular certain beliefs and perspectives may be. Let me date myself here. Some of you, like me, are old enough to remember a book that came out in the early 1970s called The Late Great Planet Earth, written by Hal Lindsey. The book made millions of dollars and made both Mr. Lindsay and his publisher quite wealthy. Fifty years later, much of what was written as what the Word of God, particularly in the book of Revelation, clearly teaches, has been proven to be bunk. American-influenced bunk. American-influenced speculation. All of that to say, be careful. Before you believe everything that Josephus speculated about, or about everything that your favorite author or speaker today speculates about. Remember that smarter people than they have been proven wrong. And so as we conclude today, I remind you again to know the difference between what is popular and what is wise. And if you allow that to happen, And to think thoughts like that whenever you hear the name Hagar or Ishmael, this nobody from the early pages of Genesis will have served his purpose well. Let's pray together. Lord, take these feeble thoughts and may your Holy Spirit Use them. May your Holy Spirit edit them. Take that which is useful. Apply it to hearts and minds that need it today. And help that which is useless or unnecessary to be discarded. We are amazed at the complexity of some of these stories that we think we know well. And even as we just scratch the surface of them in this series of messages, we recognize again our need to be open to the Holy Spirit of God, the divine teacher. For what we take away from them of value, for what we take away from them that we can apply to our own lives. 
And so, Lord, if the time spent this morning on this story does nothing else but encourage some of our listeners to dig deeper into this story, to read more, to find out more about Josephus, to think more about how easily influenced we are and how sometimes those who tell us this is what the Bible clearly teaches are really telling us this is what I think the Bible clearly teaches. Help us to be discerning, O God. Help our faith to ultimately be in you, not any one individual, including even this speaker. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.